everyone. Um, thank you for bearing with me at the end of a long day. Um, I think I'm bringing this back to the clinic um, quite concretely to, um, I'm going to be talking about cultural, um, about formulation, case formulation. So it's kind of bringing some of the discussions that we've been having and some of the tensions that we've been discussing. Um, I think it aligns well with what um, Andrew just presented. And I think it picks up on Lena's comment earlier about for e-cognition, maybe being really like the given for some, but really not being very widespread in others. And so this is largely, we draw heavily on for e-cognition. Um, but I'm going to start by um, slightly reframing this talk um, with an alternative title uh, that introduces complexity from the get-go. Um, and um, it's because I feel that complexity is a big part of the challenges that are faced by neuroscience and psychiatry. But it's also the ground, it sets the ground for this, um, for this presentation, but mainly um, it, it motivates the cultural eco-social eco systems view that I will, present, will, be, will be presenting. And so the cultural eco-social systems view is an attempt at advancing a more integrative praxis in psychiatry, perhaps one that will harm less. Um, an attempt to counter the notion of psychiatry as clinical neuroscience, and a step towards integrating the perpetuating psychiatric dichotomies, which have now been fashioned as precision or person-centered um, psychiatry, which Guillaume spoke about, and a precision-centered, um, no, person-centered psychiatry. Um, so this will tick. I don't have anything to disclose. Um, and the premise being here that neuroscience um, play a central role in current psychiatric theory and research, and that there are increasing efforts to translate these uh, research and theoretical um, intentions into clinical practice. The contemporary psychiatry seeks to the mechanisms of mental disorders in neurobiology and aims to char characterize psychopathology and its experience, which is quite an important piece, in terms of brain circuitry and brain systems. And I think the degree to which this may be more harmful than healing needs no elaboration here. But I'm amu I was amused to, while walking through Paris, find this thing called urgence neurosciences. Like, what is an, an, a like neuroscientific emergency? I mean, this might be one. Um, <laughs> and so um, what I'm going to be arguing is for the importance of adopting an, a cultural eco-social system to you um, for psychiatric theory, research, and practice as a way to better capture and characterize the complexity in psychopathology or more broadly, in experience of distress, with a focus on clinical case formulation. And before that I do that, I'm going to briefly gloss over the pragmatics of complexity and its implications for the clinic, as, at least as it pertains to this talk, and as a backdrop to the cultural eco-social systems view that then I'll present at the end. And my rationale is that complexity in psychopathology is a given, and though frequently reduced um, to, for, for us to be able to act on it, whether for studying it, for nosology, for prevention, or for clinical intervention, to actually advance the field of psychiatry, complexity needs to be at a minimum uh, conceptually embraced. Um, so a cultural eco-social systems view, I think, provides the necessary language for this shift. And applying it to case formulation very specifically, I think can contribute to snowballing the shift into other domains by offering a complex, adaptive system informed clinical data to the other research um, fields and a more um, integrative understanding of clinical cases. Um, so it goes without saying that like reviewing complexity here today uh, is beyond the scope of this talk, but also of my um, expertise. But for the sake of overview, I'm going to give you a brief recap. So complexity characterizes something with many parts that interact with each other in multiple ways, culminating in higher order of self-organization or in an emergent process that is greater than the sum of its parts. Complexity is a characteristic of a system. And a system depends on the components considered or the boundaries we are setting. From health systems to family systems to humans as complex adaptive systems, complexity is a characteristic of all of those. And definitions of complexity are varied and are often tailored to the kind of phenomenon that we're studying. So social sciences are often using it in a much more metaphorical way, whereas uh, computer science or mathematics use it uh, for quantitative modeling. So what about the clinic? And so um, 
in a conversation with Lawrence, he said, well, let's, why don't you look at complexity in our billing codes? So looking at those, the extent of complexity here is reduced to cases that intersect with the legal or the youth protection system, those with language barriers, or those with three or more psychiatric diagnoses. But I dare say that cl clinical complexity extends beyond this. Um, in fact, um, the question is, which cases are not complex? Um, as for billing complexity, I would need to sort of start coding them with some kind of unspecific complexity and be able to cash it in. Um, I think maybe what in this case they're doing is that only instances where complexity is at the, like, uh, tangibly at the forefront of the clinical uh, interaction are being uh, accounted here. And this is more of an admi administrative classification, but I think it reflects the, the reductionist paradigms that inform biomedically aligned healthcare practices and the misalignment between healthcare and the human organism as a complex adaptive system. Um, and this Harper cover puts it really boldly. If surgery were indeed the solution to the opioid crisis, maybe we could continue to reduce complexity. Alas, it seems we're doomed to embrace it. Um, at a minimum, to avoid things like the idea that surgery could possibly be the answer to the opioid crisis and everything that it entails. And addressing the complexity of psychiatric disorders, which is nicely captured by the faded causal loop diagram of cognitive, social, and environmental dimensions of the opioid crisis, that remains a challenge. Importantly, underlying the tension that is depicted here is this uh, reductionist understanding of health and illness experience. And it's an understanding that prioritizes the physical and the biomedical explanation. It prioritizes linear causality, categorical distinction between physiological and non-physiological processes, while at the same time treating patient self-understanding, narrative elaborations of self and social interactions as secondary or even irrelevant to the basic mechanisms of psychiatric disorders. And I think it's important to underline the basic mechanisms. It's not just an add-on that I'm listing here. It's actually basic to the mechanism of the disorder. Um, so a big part of the challenge relates um, to how reductionist approaches in research and practice have been disregarding um, the implications of humans as complex adaptive systems. So let's turn to the properties of a complex adaptive systems and their implications. So as I've said, a complex system is a whole entity comprised of interactive components with a shared goal or purpose. And complex adaptive systems are those that have ability to adapt to a changing environment. They're both changed and can change the environment themselves. So humans are complex adaptive systems. And properties of complex adaptive systems include that they're adaptive, that they have perme permeable borders, that is the system is open to the surroundings and in exchange with them. That they um, have sensitivity to initial conditions or what we call path dependence. That they have a history, that they're self-organizing, they that refers to the interaction between the agents or the components. That that they experience emergence, which refers to the, the system level changes, that they're irreducible, they cannot be reduced to its components, and that they follow the principle of non-linearity, causality can begin anywhere in the system, which also means that they operate between order and chaos, new system behavior is often unpredictable and difficult to trace back to a specific cause, and, and the fact that the control is, of, is this decentralized. They experience allostasis, which involves the ability to adapt to a changing environment, and it also reflects their goal directedness. So if we follow this logic, then the health of an individual will be an expression of a system in action. So this very elaborate model of depression as a systemic syndrome, mapping the feedback loops of major depressive disorder, is one of the examples, and it's a few examples, because there are not that many, that takes the implications of complex adaptive systems very seriously. It's a great paper, I can only recommend it. It's on every single one of my presentations. Um, so if we want to understand and respond to psychopathology and related experiences, we will need to consider the implications of these properties and very, um, we will need to consider them seriously. So I'm, I'm not gonna be able to discuss them in, in depth, but I'm gonna flag the particularly relevant ones and then largely the neglected ones. So the fact that they're adaptive means that we need to focus on process uh, rather than on factors. The permeable borders are part of this adaptability. 
and um, the system is open to its surroundings, but this is a social and cultural environment. They're relational, and so interactions matter. The fact that they're path dependent and sensitive to initial conditions means that trajectories will matter. The fact that they have a history means that timing matters. The fact that they're irreducible means that they're multi-level. The fact that they follow um, principles of non-linearity calls for organizational causality. And this also um, implies that uh, a sense of the idea of multi-finality, they're like one, the same path to many outcomes, and equifinality, many paths to the same outcome. The fact that they adapt through allostasis means that their compensatory mechanisms are important. So these are the ones that are really important and partially considered both in psychiatry and in neuroscience, but mostly not really. Um, let me turn to the ones that I think uh, are particularly neglected, if not totally ignored. Humans are not just self-organizing and relational in a, culture, in a social cultural environment, uh, meaning that interactions matter. This also means that they have culture and that they're linguistic and that they're self-reflective. And the use of language enables self-describing, self-interpretation, self-reflection. And these processes exert influence on the environment, leading to cultural constructed niches, ultimately culture, but they also influence ourselves, what and how we think, oops, what and how we think um, will, will impact how we, um, wait, I lost my train of Um, so what I was saying is that they influence ourselves and what and how we think, and you have to think of Ian Hacking's looping effects that we just heard about, or, or even active inference here. So I think that taking all of these um, seriously uh, is going to simplify our work in the long term. And um, this is just an example. It's, it's very well established that what and how a person thinks about the symptoms impacts their experience, their behavior, their sense of agency, and whether, when, and how, uh, and where they seek help. So the ways people attend to and interpret sensations, events, cope with symptoms or distress, or even how they respond to treatment, are all shaped by culture. And in this paper, uh, the authors, it's a, it's a really cool paper, found that learning one's genetic risk changed physiology independently of the actual genetic risk. So the implications for psychopathology uh, of everything that we've just said include that um, developmental process of learning and adaptation through ongoing interactions with the um, social environment that symptoms um, emerge in specific social contexts and predicaments, that individuals' narrative self-construal, cultural-mediated um, interpretations and responses of others are important, that causal processes can begin anywhere, and, and that illness trajectories um, depend on developmental processes that are on multiple spatial and temporal scales that span the neurobiological, the cognitive affective, the interpersonal, the social, and the cultural systems, including the mental health systems itself. So taking this seriously implies that the study of human experience and behaviors, such as those in psychopathology, requires approaches that will consider these multiple levels and their interactions, as well as the contextual and environmental embedding from inception through lifelong development. And this table presents some of the examples of multi-level frameworks that are currently used in clinical and research settings. And they were all developed for different purposes. I'm not gonna go through them in detail, but each of them can contribute to an integrative approach. Um, and within each of these approaches, the levels are then unpacked in terms of specific facets or processes that can be measured at the individual, um, in from collecting information from the individual, and um, they use these constructs that characterize multi-level explanatory levels. But none of them provide any general account of how these levels could be integrated, neither conceptually nor pragmatically, nor do they sufficiently account for the effects of cultural meaning, social context, and self-understanding. But the cultural ecosocial systems approach, I think, I hope, offers a path to integration. And it does so by applying for e-cognitive science con constructs, embodiment, enactment, embedding, and extension, that conceptually describe processes that do span these levels, or at least multiple of those levels. 
So this is another example that highlights the importance of careful attention to the dynamic between these processes and that calls for the need of integrating um, the, the levels. In this study, the authors found that an association between neighborhood poverty and hypocapital volume amongst individuals at high risk for psychosis. But they also found that this relationship was moderated by social engagement, meaning that a higher levels of social engagement were actually protective of hypocampal volume reduction. It's just an example to illustrate the importance of considering a more integrative approach. So the call for more integrative approaches to psychiatric case formulation is long-standing. And what, we're, what I'm trying to do here with the eco-social cultural approach is um, offering a scaffold. Um, and the language to advance not only integration across, across culture, mind, and brain, which is relevant to mental health, but maybe also to advance a more mechanistic understanding of the dynamics between the different dimensions that each of these disciplines prioritize. So I think I've answered these questions, but I'm just gonna go through them very quickly. So why cultural? Because of how cultural meaning systems, language, values, norms, practices, identities, institutions, and cultural affordances mediate neurobiology, illness experience, coping, and adaptation through processes of attention, interpretation, and social interaction. Why eco? Because instead of restricting the focus to discrete organisms or their components, ecology emphasizes an essentially interactive nature of living systems across multiple levels of organization, including the interactions of individual organisms with each other and their physical environment. Why social and structural? because humans are relational and their environments are social from inception, marked by social interactions, but also by the social structural predicaments. And I think we've covered the systemic. Very briefly, um, what I want to show with this slide is I want to acknowledge that the cultural eco-social systems approach draws from very many disciplines, and here is some of them listed, it's not exhaustive, and builds on previous attempts to emphasize the embedding of all biology, development, experience in interactive systems of bodies, brains, people situated in social environment. Um, I'm not going to go into these for the sake of time, but I wanted to acknowledge them. And again, I'm not going to go through this because I'm preaching to the choir, uh, but recognizing that psychopathology and well-being and their, and their neurobiological correlates, and I think that that's a really important thing. Well-being has neurobiological correlates, not just um, psychopathology. So we could say that being in love is neurological, right? Um, always emerge in specific relational contexts, meaning that social, structural, interpersonal, and cultural processes should be included in the mechanistic models of psychopathology, pathophysiology, and recovery. And so what we do here, drawing on cultural psychiatry work, uh, we define key dimensions of social and cultural context that need to be considered in a cultural ecosocial systems approach. And so we include um, a life um, developmental dimension, a social structural dimension, a cultural historical dimension, and an experiential dimension. Okay, so as I said, to integrate across these levels and take a process-oriented approach, we use concepts that stem for, for, from cognitive science and inactivism. And so along with others, we propose that 4E cognitive science can help us rethink the interplay of bodily, psychological, and social processes in psychiatric disorders. The 4Es, and I, I, we, I think we've heard them, but I'm just going to go through them anyway, embodiment, enactment, embedding, and extension, I think actually describe really intuitive and obvious processes, but for which maybe systematic language was missing for a while, which is why they were picked up the way they were. In a nutshell, 4E cognition views human cognition and behavior as grounded in bodily experience, embodied, which is embedded in and affected by um, physiological, psychological, and social cultural context through cycles of action and perception called enactments, which extend into the environment in forms of interactions with other people and through cultural affordances, also known as potentials for action and perception. That the tools like a hammer or media, virtual reality glasses, or institutions offer. In this way, four E's then provide ways to characterize causal loops that span multiple levels. So I'm going to exemplify, because sometimes that's easier. 
If you take my stage fright anxiety when I give a presentation, I potentially embody the anxiety through disrupted sleep, heart rate changes, sweating, potentially some irritability, and then I enact it at multiple levels. I stay up late, I prepare, I wake up early, I rehearse so as to feel prepare, prepared, I tell myself it's gonna be over soon, and then I extend it by having notes that I have to read that um, support my working memory. And all this is embedded in a historical, developmental, and relational context to what more immediately this conference means and who's sitting here and how I feel towards that and what it represents. So it's these embedded, um, embodied, and enacted cycles of engagement with the world that leads to adaptive behavior, agency, and subjectivity. And so by giving a detailed and empirical testable account of these circular processes, the 4E cognitive science then moves us beyond these stratified levels of description that characterize biomedical research towards a more integrative view that extends the notions of systems biology from the level of cell metabolism, physiology, brain circuitry, to include the dynamics of cognition, interpersonal interaction, and social systems. So I'm gonna take this to the clinic. And these are really text-heavy slides, I'm sorry. That's the clinician taking long notes instead of short notes. Um, so this is a fictional case of um, an 18-year-old female. She, her, self-identifies as um, middle-income Italian-Canadian. She presents with increasing daytime fatigue, lack of motivation, and concerns about her health, her general health. She says, my brain doesn't let me focus on anything and suggests I need to regulate my serotonin or my dopamine because she has no interest in school or much else. She mentions that she might be sick with extended effects of a viral upper respiratory infection, probably influenza, or maybe that her problem is depression. She has a lot of ups and downs in her mood and she sometimes just zones out, especially when she's stressed. She describes difficulty falling asleep and episodes of binge eating frequent arguments with her close friends and family. She has a history of suicidal ideation, but does not currently present with any thoughts of suicide. And regarding recent life events, she explains that she has just started university and is finding it difficult to make new friends and to manage the workload. There's a family history. The father has a history of major depression. And developmentally, she says that she's always been described as a sen sensitive child and describes a childhood that was lacking in care and at times emotionally abusive. She said her parents argued a lot and she felt that they only paid attention to her when she did not do well at school or when she was sick. When, when she did poorly in school, she was harsh, harshly punished. At the age of nine, she experienced a tumultuous divorce of her parents who, that followed that was followed by long-standing conflict between them regarding shared childcare. So I'm gonna go through multiple ways that we could conceptualize this case, starting with the diagnostic formulation, a very sort of straightforward way. And the provisional diagnosis would be major depressive disorder, with a differential diagnosis maybe that rules out persistent depressive disorder, bipolar, bipolar two disorder, adjustment disorder with mixed anxiety and depressed mood. Uh, we may consider, a we may consider um, social anxiety disorder and maybe even discuss cluster B or cluster C personality traits. Um, so that would be sort of a very basic diagnostic formulation. We switch to a narrative biopsychosocial formulation. Um, we might, um, that would consider that she's facing a developmental crisis precipitated by her transition to university in the context of a history of social and performance anxiety with difficulties in emotion regulation. She might be biologically predisposed to depression because of her sensitive temperament, family history of depression, and recent exposure to influenza. Psychologically, she's struggling with fears of failure and rejection that exacerbate her symptoms. These difficulties can be understood developmentally as occurring due to childhood experiences of lack of validation of her emotions alongside inconsistent parental affective availability and conflictual interactions. Her maladaptive coping mechanisms like binge eating or suicidal ideation might be indicative of developmentally learned behaviors that are perpetuated by current interpersonal dysfunction. And so depending on the immediate concerns of the patient, the context of the assessment, and available resources, any of these difficulties might be prioritized and guide the choice of treatment intervention. So that's a narrative biopsychosocial formulation. I've left out the uh, protective factors. Usually it's predictive, predisposing, perpetuated, and then protect it, but I left those out. 
So if we turn to our cultural ecosocial systems formulation, um, on the other hand, it would pay explicit attention to the ways in which um, the dimensions that are described by the patient interact with each other in the context of her local niche and her wider environment. It would look at system dynamics and embodied experience across developmental trajectories and how they interact with social structure and are mediated by sense making that draws from cultural historical context. The patient has embodied developmental experience of interpersonal co-regulation of the stress and exposure to abuse and neglect that are enacted through processes of sense making and include core assumptions or expectations about self-worth and lovability as being dependent on performance. These results in the transition to university being a particular challenge. Any life transition comes with a challenge associated with novelty and uncertainty, as well as specific social norms and cultural expectations that can further strain allostasis. For this patient, though, the adaptive challenges may be intensified by embodied and enacted fears and assumptions that exceed her capacity for emotion regulation and lead to symptom development. Her embodied experience of anxiety, lack of motivation, and anhedonia are enacted and extended through cognitive and behavioral actions such as school avoidance, social withdrawal, and binge eating, which contribute to her distress and affect her self-efficacy and self sense of agency with consequences for coping and help seeking. These behaviors emerge through ongoing interactions with her immediate social environments and wider cultural contexts, which mandate academic success, self-containment, and robust individualism. A multimodal treatment plan may include interventions that aim to modify the patient's self-understanding, coping strategies, and interpersonal interactions on the basis of systemic understanding that changes to emotion regulation at the levels of brain, person, and social networks will have mutually reinforcing effects on other levels. So what's different about a cultural ecosocial systems clinical formulation, you may ask, from what we just described? And I think a, a closer reading rather than a quick sort of throwing at you might be important for that. But I'm just going to list some things. It shifts from simply listing risks and preventive factors to elaborating an integrative, process-oriented systems view. It emphasizes the social ecological context to highlight the essentially dynamic and interactional nature of bio, psycho, and social processes. And it expands them to include culture. And it uses work in 4E um, to integrate um, across processes which involves multiple levels and gives a more process-oriented formulation. And it includes explicit attention to how self-understanding and illness explanation are looping back to affect the neurobiology, the cognition, and the coping um, and treatment responses. So in this model, to, to return to the uh, major depression as a systemic, um, systemic syndrome, a cultural ecosocial systems approach would reinforce the understanding of brain-person environment as a dynamic system and might try and um, highlight the fact that if you look at economic status, that's an issue that arises between social system and intersubjectivity, whereas uh, the financial stress is experienced somewhere in between the social system and the intersubjective, and so forth and so I'm going to carry on for the sake of time. And so this approach uh, responds to concerns that the information conveyed by a psychiatric diagnosis is not actually sufficient for therapeutic or prognostic purposes and therefore using them in research is actually not that useful. And to the call for more pluralistic frameworks, and, and it, at the same time it aims or hopes to broaden the scope of basic research on the nature of psychiatric disorders, to develop integrative person-centered case formulation that can facilitate bed to bed bench and bedside knowledge translation and implementation gaps. It brings research and clinical practice into closer alignment and better qualifies the knowledge gaps and it hopes to provide ecologically valid mechanistic explanations that include agency and subjectivity, and then ultimately to refocus policy and practice to emphasize an ecological view via in interventions that address social determinants of mental health. And I'll end by thanking um, the group, the GAP Committee on Cultural Psychiatry that was part of thinking through some of this. Thank you.